Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to another um, another of our our uh, education seminars, um, and uh, I believe this is another in the in the series of of offshore um, our offshore series. Um, so tonight tonight our discussion will be about um, um, medical and and first aid for offshore sailors. Okay, our speaker will be Dr. Gary Nackman. Okay. Um, Okay, just again, stock stock reminders. Okay, if you're if you aren't speaking, please stay on mute. Um, we are in a little bit different than what the second reminder says. Is we will we will uh, Dr. Nachman will stop during you know periods during the um, during the presentations for questions. Um, we we will have a Q and A at the end. And again, we're going to have a, a quick introduction to RYC uh, before the Q and A session. Um, and as you probably heard, this session is being recorded um, and will be posted if you miss it. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, you can uh, log at, out or stay on mute, whichever you choose. Okay. Um, so Dr. Nackman has been a lifelong sailor, uh, a series of boats, um, done the Bermuda race uh, around Long Island, uh, Bermuda race both from Newport and Marion a couple times. Uh, around Long Island. Current boat is as high note. Um, and um, he has a, a bunch of, of, in addition to racing, has done a lot of um, offshore cruising as well. Um, and as you can see, he's a member of both RYC and Storm Trisail Club. So let me um, introduce now um, uh, Dr. Gary Nachman. Okay, thank you, Luke. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you for the introduction. So what are the health issues in the water? What are the dangers? Who is at risk? What injuries can occur? What are their causes? How to prevent injuries before they happen? And how to deal with injuries and illnesses uh, when they do occur? That's what we're going to try to cover tonight. So who am I? I'm a general and uh, vascular surgeon with extensive trauma experience. Uh, I was a full-time professor, now I'm a former professor at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And through my training, I became an advanced trauma life support instructor, uh, a U.S. Uh, sailing level one instructor, and uh, an avid sailor. So one of the most important questions that uh, you need to ask yourself when you're caring for somebody during some type of medical emergency is, do I need help? So when faced with the emergency, do you have the skills required to assess and care for this person or is this beyond? <clears throat> and so how can you get help? And it really depends on what kind of sailing uh, you're doing. Uh, you know, if we're right here in the Bay, probably the best way to get help is with your cell phone or your VHF. If you're offshore, you're really gonna need a sat phone or single sideband uh, radio. And it's important these days. I think uh, a lot of people go offshore with um, maybe less than adequate communications, just maybe a uh, like a Garmin in reach, kind of a, a press here uh, panic button that connects to an offshore um, um, uh, station that, um, that like a global rescue station. And you might have some limited texting ability but I think being able to talk to someone is important because these days you can use your sat phone or single side band even potentially for a telemedicine consult with a physician. And that can help you decide whether or not things can be taken care of there versus requiring an evacuation, which might include uh, getting on a helicopter or a ship. <clears throat> One of the important thing about uh, medical illnesses is that sometimes a chronic problem can become acute. And so as a captain or a medical officer, let's say on a boat, you need to know the medical history of your crew. And so I always insist uh, that the crew fill out a confidential uh, index card with you know, their allergies, their medications, uh, their chronic illnesses, any past surgeries that they have. Also important are mental health issues. There was a case uh, not that many years ago of a delivery captain taking aboard someone who he didn't really know 
who had a mental health crisis that was on uh, while they were out there and the person eventually uh, uh, fell overboard uh, and died. It's important to know if somebody has diabetes because having a problem with low or high blood sugar can be fatal. Heart disease, you could have a heart attack, you could have uh, an arrhythmia of the heart and an irregular heart rhythm, and that could lead to a stroke. Pulmonary disease, asthma, COPD or emphysema, also uh, you need to be able to potentially handle that kind of a crisis. Something as simple as allergic reaction. Somebody could go into an anaphylactic shock and unless you have the ability to give them an EpiPen, uh, you might not be able to save them. Chronic spine problems uh, can cause a problem. Uh, severe pain, muscle weakness, or even paralysis, all those could occur. So I, I like to joke that I've been sailing um, since before I was born, since my mother was pregnant with me when my uh, mom and dad learned how to sail in the Chesapeake Bay. And in the 50 years that I can remember, uh, you know, I've seen a number of minor injuries, some broken fingers, one serious crush finger, finger. Um, one person uh, suffered fractured ribs on a Bermuda race on my, on my boat, sunburn, dehydration, la lacerations, sprains. Um, there was a true medical emergency via VHF that we witnessed was uh, the Coast Guard talking to a boat uh, where someone had a cardiac arrest and they were having trouble doing CPR. Uh, we were too far away to help, but we were trying to communicate with them. Um, man overboard. Uh, we, I've been involved with two man overboards. Um, unfortunately, one was me as a teen. One was my friend JT going off the bow. Um, recovery of another vessel's uh, man overboard with one of my sons in, New in Nantucket Harbor. And... Uh, as a teenager, when we were sailing uh, to Nova Scotia, uh, we were aiding the Coast Guard in the search for a mission uh, fishermen off George's Bank. So what happens when you're sailing uh, on a boat? How, how risky is it? So there was an interesting study that was published uh, in 2015 that looked at 11 years uh, worth of data uh, compiled uh, by the Coast Guard. And uh, in summary, there were 271 sailing related fatalities, 841 injuries, uh, it resulted in a 1.19 deaths per million sailing person days. So it's pretty safe to be on a sailboat. Weather and hazardous waters were the primary cause. Drowning accounted for 73% of the fatalities and 82% of those that drowned were not wearing their PFDs. Alcohol was a factor in 12%. Uh, pilot, so-called pilot error or passenger preventable error, preventable error occurred in about half. Uh, collision and grounding of sailboats uh, were part of 43% of the uh, fatalities. So uh, in 2016, the Newport Bermuda race uh, collected uh, medical issues that occurred during the race and then uh, made them available. So about 13% of vessels reported medical issues. Um, of those that had the issues, 15% contacted the race officials or a race medical consultant who was an, an ER physician. Uh, and very common problems of seasickness and injured fingers. I'm kind of surprised uh, that people needed to get help for that kind of a thing, but it's excellent uh, that those kind of resources are made available. Um, in terms of damage to boats, about 16% had some damage. And very common you know, problems with sails, spars, deck hardware, and rudders. In 2015, uh, there was a fatality in the uh, Marion Bermuda race on the second day of the race. Uh, someone suffered a cardiac arrest. He was unable to be resuscitated by CPR defibrillator. Uh, the deceased had a history of heart disease and had stopped taking his medication. It's not clear if he had been uh, seasick, if that had a role uh, in that. In 1989, there was a fatality of a crewman due to head injury. An accidental jibe resulted in fatal head injury. Other race fatalities that involved uh, problems with the uh, boom or the main sheet 
uh, I listed here, I did a, uh, a search of their uh, database uh, from the Bermuda race, and this is what was listed. It's, a, it's probably the most common cause uh, of death on a boat is being hit by the boom or the main sheet and being thrown overboard. Uh, that's why the category one race requirements require some form of anti-jive device. So this is something that I created, how to deal with an emergency, how to react or recognize what's going on, evacuate the victim from immediate danger, assess the injury or the illness, call for help and treat the problem. So how do you evaluate somebody? Uh, in medicine, we call it the ABCs, which stands for airway. If somebody can talk, they have an open airway. So if you're worried somebody is choking you know, on their food, as long as they're able to talk, you really should not intervene. If somebody, let's say, gets hit in the head and they have a jaw fracture or hit in the neck, that can impair the airway. But as long as they're able to talk, they have an open airway. Breathing. How do you assess breathing? Well, if they're talking, they're breathing. But let's say they're unconscious. Well, you just look at their chest. Does their chest rise and fall? Are their lips pink or blue? Are they being oxygenated? If you have a stethoscope, it's not that hard to assess somebody to see if they have breath sounds. Um, you can go to CVS and buy a cheap stethoscope and it's not bad. Uh, if you have no stethoscope, you can actually just put your ear on the chest and listen for breath sounds. Circulation. Can you feel a pulse or a blood pressure? You can buy a fairly inexpensive automatic blood pressure cuff and everybody should have one on board. Can you feel a pulse? Can you feel a carotid pulse? Somebody has a carotid pulsation, they probably have a minimum systolic pressure of 80. If somebody's mentating and communicating, they probably have sufficient blood pressure for the moment. Another part of circulation is is there visible bleeding? So you want to see if somebody um, is hemorrhaging because that's something you need to address. So other issues, dehydration. What causes dehydration? Well, fluid loss due to sweating, fluid loss due to vomiting, fluid loss due to diarrhea, too much alcohol and drugs. And dehydration is very serious. Um, on, the on the international scale, the number one cause of death in the world is fluid loss due to diarrhea. Uh, and so you really should not you know, underestimate how severe somebody uh, can become dehydrated, let's say if they're seasick. So what is seasickness? Body and mind response to motion. It's worsened by alcohol and dehydration, but the worst thing you can do is really uh, drink a lot of alcohol the night before a race. Uh, it increases uh, as you get older, the likelihood. Um, people get drowsy initially, some nausea, vomiting, or a sense of general unease. It's really best treated before it starts. It's a little controversial uh, what the best treatment uh, for it is. Dramamine, bonine, scopolamine, patch, all are very useful. Some people think ginger or wristbands help. There is some clinical data suggesting ginger may be useful. Uh, the clinical data on wristbands is pretty poor. Um, clearly being down below is not a good place to be. Uh, getting some fresh air, come up on deck, uh, come to the kind of the center of motion of the boat kind of towards the middle. Uh, give somebody something to do, let them drive. Personally, I like crackers. Um, this is a table from a recently published paper that listed some of the different agents. Um, scopolamine is uh, very useful. Um, it says on the insert that you should, it on, you should put it on uh, the night before uh, the uh, going on the water. But I can tell you, my cousin actually used to work for Sibagagi and actually was running one of the clinical trials. And they had clinical data showing that even if you put it on two days before, you get a better response, but they thought that would turn people off from buying it. So the, the sooner you put it on, the better. 
I would recommend that people try it even before they go sailing just to see how it feels because occasionally it makes people act a little loopy. Um, the, the other drugs that are used are really classified as different types of antihistamines. Some antihistamines cross the blood brain barrier and make you drowsy like the original Dramamine or chlorf chlorfenhyramine, uh, things like Benadryl. Um, the ones that don't are meclizine uh, or promethazine. There are some studies showing that promethazine, also known as Phenergan, is probably the most uh, successful uh, anti seasick medication uh, in terms of preventing vomiting, in terms of preventing nausea, it's pretty much tied with scopolamine. Heat stroke is a condition caused by your body overheating. Heat stroke can occur if your body temperature rises to 104 degrees or higher and it requires emergency treatment. So what are the symptoms? A high body temperature, altered mental state of behavior, alteration in sweating. If somebody stops sweating, that's a very bad sign. Nausea and vomiting, flush skin, rapid breathing, racing heart rate, or headache. So what's the treatment? Very important to get the person into shade or indoors. Remove excessive clothing and cool the person down with cold compresses, water, ice. So before we go to hypothermia, I'm gonna just pause a minute for questions. So Gary, is, we have more comments and questions right now. Um, so one is said, one is said that he's seen a patient with uh, renal colic and obstructed kidney stone. Um, people are asking about the the scopolamine patch, saying that it had made them hallucinate. Um, we we know one person who uses the patch and sees vivid movies the entire trip to Bermuda. So do you have any comments about that? Uh, that's very true. It is a reported side effect. And that's one of the reasons uh, people should try it before they get on board. And that was actually the comment that you should, you should test drive before you go offshore. Uh, one gentleman suggested that they had to put their crew ashore. Obviously, that was uh, near shore if they could do that. Uh, but that's not always the option. Any... any Comments on uh, seasickness uh, drugs that have fewer side effects? Well, they all have pretty similar side effects. You can, uh, the drowsiness and dry mouth are the most common, uh, but you could probably have some hallucinations with any one of them, but I think the scopolamine uh, is, is the worst in terms of the hallucinations. Okay, but it's thank not you. A very high, it's not a very high incidence. Um, one question came even before our, our chat, our conversation, and that was around EpiPens. Um, should boats have them on board for, uh, for the crew? I think so, uh, absolutely. Um, you never know when you're gonna have your first allergic reaction. You know, if you're just sailing on the bay, you know, you can call, you call a mayday out and the police, you know, squad, you know, or EMS has it in their kit. But you know, somebody can stop breathing in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. and I think we'll get to this next question, but people are asking about uh, defibrillators, and also about like phone EKG readings, uh, things of that nature. So if you're going to cover it later, we can cover it then if you wanted to address it now, please do. Um, I carry an AED. Um, I think it's very reasonable to have. You can buy them used online. They're not that expensive. Um, they can make a real difference uh, in what happens when somebody has a cardiac arrest. You know, even if you're far offshore, I've heard some people kind of have a nihilistic opinion, like if you are, have a heart attack offshore and you need an AED, you're dead. It's not necessarily the case. Sometimes one of the first things that happens when somebody has, you know, a cardiac event they have an arrhythmia. And if you can bring them back from the arrhythmia, you, you may have some time. Okay. And, and sorry, for the layman, can you just say exactly what that is? An AED? Yeah, it's a defibrillator. Okay. Automatic, 
uh, the, the, the pulse, uh, the EKG checks that you can do with your smartphone uh, gives you a rhythm. It gives you some limited information. It's, if you have anybody with a pacemaker or a heart condition on board, probably a good thing to have. And uh, one gentleman asked, does more sailing cure seasickness? I know harbors often cure seasicknesses. And I'll let you answer the, the serious question. So. Most people get over seasickness in a few days. Some people don't. Um, I, uh, a friend of mine who uh, I used to work with uh, did the uh, first uh, Marin Bermuda race. He's a, he's a physician. And from the pretty much the first night, he was seasick the entire race. Um, in fact, uh, when we got home, he sold all his offshore uh, uh, PLBs and his life jacket, I believe. And uh, he decided he was never going to go offshore like that again. Um, I had one physician uh, a number of years later on a race also who got seasick and really kind of hid how sick he was and got dehydrated, fell down the companion way and broke two ribs, never told anybody. Not a brilliant idea. No. Um, so communication on board about what's going on is important. That's really the job, you know, the captain, you know, when he asks, you know, is everybody okay? You got to get an honest answer. Um, the, the first person I almost started an intravenous to hydrate him, but he was able to keep, you know, after two days, he was able to keep liquids down. And, and I will just comment that being offshore with someone who's seasick and doesn't tell you can be a very interesting experience because oftentimes you don't know why they're behaving the way they are behaving and they will behave differently, at least my observations. Um, two other items, and then I'm gonna let you go to the next point, but uh, one person is talking about mixing bonding and dramming and then taking a non-drowsy cold pill to counteract the sleepiness uh, from, from the bonding dramming. So I, I think I want to hear something from you on that and I'll just let that be and then I'll ask the second question. That, that's what one of one of the things that NASA recommends, yeah, believe it or not, what they give the astronauts is they basically give them uh, a stimulant uh, along with, uh, you know, the antihistamine style anti seasick medications uh, to basically counteract the drowsiness. So caffeine is probably a good thing, uh, even something maybe like Sudafed. Uh, might also work as well. Okay. And uh, one person just had the question about what was the other top uh, anti seasickness pill that was mentioned. So you, I think you mentioned two. Yeah, pro promethazine, phenergan. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So that actually came through the chat. And that's it for the questions as of now. So I'll let you go to the next part. Okay. So hypothermia is a condition that exists when the body's temperature drops below 95 degrees. This can be caused by exposure to water or air. And in fact, even if the water is a little warmer than the air, you're better off being in the air, not in the water because you lose more heat in water when your body is in contact. Uh, the loss of body heat results in a loss of dexterity loss of consciousness and eventual loss of life. It becomes difficult to swim and hard to float. So one year um, we took uh, Blue Note, my, uh, my former boat, the Bristol 43-3 from Lockwoods to the Hinkley Yard at Portsmouth uh, the week before Easter. It was kind of cold. We actually had to chip uh, the ice off the deck to get the dock lines uh, off the cleats. And this is a picture of that. And it was pretty cold that day and we were pretty cognizant of, uh, we didn't really wanna fall into the water. Uh, the red arrow shows what the water temperature was that day. It was in the low fifties. It was one of the coldest trips we ever did. We, we actually did not go day and night. When the sun went down, it was pretty hard to keep warm. And so this is a hypothermia chart. Uh, that I stole from someplace, probably from the Coast Guard that shows what your survival time is uh, in cold water, which is defined really as water you know, below 60 degrees. And in the very cold water, um, you don't typically die of hypothermia, you drown 
uh, unless you have a PFD initially, because you just can't help yourself. The water is so cold and you lose the ability to swim. So the first phase of cold water immersion is called the cold water shock. A sudden unexpected entry into cold water may cause a reflexive gasp, allowing water to enter the lungs. I actually had this happen to myself once. I, uh, when I was taking the uh, US sailing level one instructor course, it was over at the Navasink River uh, at the Mammoth Boat Club. And I misread the instructions. It was given in very early spring and I thought it said, don't wear uh, a wetsuit. And it said, wear a wetsuit. And so we had to do a swim test really early in the spring. And I jumped into the water. Fortunately, it was fairly shallow, but I absolutely felt that gasp and had my head gone underwater, I might've drowned or come up sputtering. And so if you have to enter cold water, it's not a bad idea to cover your mouth. Drowning can uh, be almost instantaneous. The data shows that roughly 20% of people die in the first minute when they go into cold water. Uh, in some, the cold shock triggers a heart attack. Surviving the stage requires you to stay calm and get your breathing under control if you're gonna survive. So mild hypothermia, the person feels cold, has violent shivering and slurred speech. Medium, the person has a certain loss of muscle control, drowsiness, incoherence, stupor, and exhaustion, and may actually stop shivering. And that's a very bad sign. Severe hypothermia, someone lapses into unconsciousness, shows signs of respiratory distress and or cardiac arrest, probably leading to death. If you are in the water, um, you need to try to conserve your heat. Uh, this uh, slide demonstrates the help position. You don't want to kick off your boots. Boots are actually made out of things that float and it keeps the water in uh, and that water warms up. You keep all your foul weather gear on uh, and that kind of creates uh, warmth and you try to really minimize your motion and you cross your arms and you'll feel the water actually warm up uh, inside your clothing. And those that have done safety at sea, even in a swimming pool, you'll notice this. And then you start to move your arms and you'll feel the cold water rush in. If you do have somebody who uh, has hypothermia, particularly severe hypothermia, you can't just put a blanket on them. Uh, they need to be actively warmed uh, by, let's say, having two people get into a sleeping bag and you're donating your heat, uh, warm, uh, uh, you could, uh, some warm water or warm towel, uh, you could place on them, not hot enough to burn them, uh, but they need active rewarming. So burns can be a problem. How can I get burned on a boat? The sun, the exhaust pipe or other engine part, a chemical burn from battery acid, an electrical burn from the battery or the inverter, a cooking stove, or offshore racing, boiling water spilling. It's very frequent that people use these uh, camping food and you might be boiling a big pot of water, uh, which can sometimes be dangerous. So this is what a first degree burn looks like. You've all seen this, a red painful skin, being in the sun too long, really minimal care is required. This is a picture of an early second degree burn. Uh, note the blistering on this person's back. It can be very painful. Uh, this is a third degree burn. Uh, the person has no sensation. It's full thickness skin. It can be burned right down to the bone and the skin looks white uh, and leathery. So we worry about treatment for burns based on whether or not we classify them as minor or major. A minor burn is really most first degree burns. A very small secondary degree burn that's no larger than three inches in diameter, you could treat as a minor burn. The exception might be on the face or in the genitals or on the hand. Major burns really need medical attention. If you have a, a large second degree burn, you need to treat it as a major burn and third degree burns, all of them uh, require medical attention. So this is just basic first aid, minor burns. You, call, you cool the burn area to soothe the pain. You may use some cool water uh, or apply a, a clean towel dampened with cool water. 
Very important to remove rings or other tight items from the burned areas. Try to do this quickly and gently before the area swells. If you get swelling on your hand with a ring, you could actually develop gangrene of that finger. Don't break small blisters. They're really a biologic dressing. If the blisters break, gently clean the area with some mild soap and water. Apply an antibiotic ointment or some Vaseline and cover it with a nonstick gauze bandage. You can apply moisturizer or like an aloe vera lotion or gel. If needed, take an over-the-counter pain reliever and you should also consider a tetanus shot for, for uh, large uh, first degree burns or second degree burns. Make sure that your tetanus booster is up to date and that really needs to be done every 10 years. So call 911 or emergency medical help really for all major burns. Protect the burned person from further harm. Remove them from the source of the burn. If they have, let's say, uh, a fire on board and you're wearing foul weather gear, that's a big problem because those synthetic uh, clothing melts, uh, the athletic quick dry shirts, major problem. It'll get stuck to the skin. If you try to pull the clothing off, you'll probably uh, remove uh, the skin that's non-viable and also the viable skin surrounding it. Check for signs of circulation. Uh, if it's an inhalational injury with a fire in a small place, look to see if they're breathing, coughing, are they moving? Do they have uh, black sputum? Are their nose hair singes, singed? All those are really very bad things. Again, remove jewelry, belts, and other restrictive items. And don't immerse large severe burns in cold water. Doing so could cause a serious loss of body heat or drop in blood pressure and cause somebody to go into shock. And it, you should elevate the burned area because you're going to get a lot of swelling. And so try to raise the wound above heart level if possible. Cover the area of the burn, use a cool moist bandage or clean cloth. Uh, Vaseline makes a pretty good uh, burn dressing as well. Someone who has a small laceration or scrape, the most important thing to do is really prevent infection. And that's good old fashioned soap and water, wash it as soon as possible. Wash it to, to irrigate it, to remove foreign bodies in the wound, cover it and keep it clean and dry. Um, if somebody has a laceration, um, you need to direct, put direct pressure. Actually, skip the slide, let me go back here. So if somebody has a, a laceration, don't feel obligated to close it. If you close a cut, it's more likely to get infected than if you actually leave it open. You're not gonna get an abscess. Uh, and the danger is if you close it and it's not really clean, let's say some people talk about taking duct tape and closing it, you may actually cause an abscess, which is life-threatening versus letting the infection drain. So one of my favorite movies, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So a laceration with significant bleeding. In the operating room, we call this audible bleeding. You can actually hear some bleeding. And the most important thing to do is just stop the bleeding. Your step two is stop the bleeding. And step three, is stop the bleeding. How to do that? Well, direct pressure on whatever is squirting. Hold gauze if possible or whatever you have against the wound. Push hard until it stops and don't peak for 15 minutes. If it's pulsatile, I might not uh, peak at all. If necessary, place a tourniquet upstream from the wound, but not on the neck if it's a head wound, obviously. And you can use a belt, rope, or a sail tie. So it turns out that May 20th is National Stop the Bleeding Day. Um, this is basically something that the American College of Surgeons, the Committee on Trauma is promoting kind of like uh, CPR. Like people learn how to do CPR, people learn how to do the Heimlich maneuver. Well, people should learn how to stop severe life-threatening bleeding. And there's actual uh, training available either virtually uh, or in person. And if you go to this bleedingcontrol.org, there are links for this. And this is a poster they put out that shows applying direct pressure with your hands, apply a, a dressing 
right in the wound, get up close and personal and put direct pressure on it. Or let's say if somebody has uh, a pulsatile bleeding below the knee, you place a belt above the knee, you kind of create a Dutch witness, a windlass with a, uh, even a, uh, a winch handle and just turn it and then secure it in place. And you're supposed to document the time. Um, it used to be said every 15, 20 minutes, you should release uh, the tourniquet to try to let some blood down the extremity, but that's been disproven. Once you put a tourniquet on, the only person who should turn, take it off is uh, somebody in an emergency room who's prepared to, prepared to do something about the bleeding directly. So is a bone broken? Well, sometimes it's obvious as in this football injury, but sometimes it's really not obvious. Sometimes you can't tell. So when in doubt, treat it like it is. If the skin's open, clean and cover it with sterile dressing if possible. An open fracture is very risky in terms of developing uh, an infection of the bone. And if you're offshore, um, I would actually treat an open fracture uh, starting with oral antibiotics, something like uh, Keflex. Um, you should immobilize the finger or limb with the use of a splint or a sling, elevate it, if somebody loses sensation below the injury, it could be sign of a major problem. And that's a real emergency. So for an arm and shoulder injury, um, you should put somebody uh, in a simple arm sling. Every uh, Cub Scout and Boy Scout learned and probably Girl Scout learned how to do this. For a leg injury, um, you can uh, be uh, creative uh, to create a, a leg splint. Um, if you're skiing, obviously you have ski poles. If you're sailing, you probably have a boat hook. You probably have some wood on board. Uh, you can use different things to immobilize. Spine injury, very concerning. You get hit in the head by the boom. Not only might you have a brain injury, but you might fracture your spine. You fall down a companion way. Um, you may damage your cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. Uh, the key is to immobilize the entire spine. You want to keep that person's entire spine in line. So this is uh, what somebody looks like who maybe was in a car accident. An EMS comes and they put you on a backboard, a cervical collar, and these foam pads, and then they use some tape to immobilize you. Probably on board, you don't have a spine uh, immobilization kit but you can be creative. You can take a couple sneakers and a belt across the forehead. You can even just take uh, a bed sheet, uh, roll it up and put someone's head there and uh, tape uh, the head to it. So what do I have in my first aid kit? Well, I have a typical commercial kit that's really good for minor cuts and burns. It has some gauze, some burn gel, band-aids, eye irrigation, a sling, tweezers, uh, some splint material, a first aid manual is important, um, having some Tylenol, some Benadryl, some thing to clean wounds, all very useful. Uh, they sell some very fancy offshore ones, but if you go to Costco, they also carry one that's a lot cheaper that really isn't bad. Um, what do I have in my advance kit? Um, well, my crew are very concerned about falling asleep when they're not supposed to because I threatened uh, to do appendectomies on them. I carry a full surgical kit. Um, I have surgical instruments. I carry intravenous fluids and catheters to deliver that fluid. But to be honest, even if you could not start an IV, you could withdraw sterile, sterile intravenous fluid from an IV bag and actually just inject it into their subcutaneous fat believe it or not, and that fluid would be absorbed. I carry on board some IV antiemetics if somebody is vomiting and they can't hold down uh, an anti-seasickness pill. There are also things that can, given, can be given per rectum. I, I don't carry an EpiPen, but I carry epinephrine in a vial that I can drop and give to people, uh, Benadryl, prednisone, Zofran for, it's an antiemetic, Phenergan, which is, uh, the promethazine, uh, aspirin. If somebody's having a heart attack, uh, you should be taught that they should take six aspirins and chew them. Imodium and Pepto-Bismol for diarrhea. I carry some local anesthesia. I have a cardiac defibrillator. 
I carry a variety of antibiotics for skin infections, things like Keflex or z -Pak, a urinary infection, Bactrim, Cipro, a respiratory infection, something like uh, Cipro, something for a gastrointestinal infection uh, like diverticulitis, uh, Cipro and Flagyl. Uh, pain medication, uh, typically non anti-inflammatories. Uh, I might have uh, on a, a long trip, uh, something like Percocet. I have a soft cervical collar on board. I also carry an endotracheal breathing tube uh, on board in an AMBU bag, uh, a little finger pulse oximeter, uh, a full urinary catheter in case somebody went into urinary retention, a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, some fiberglass casting or splinting material, and a basic suture set. Fortunately, I've really uh, rarely had to use any of this. So in summary, uh, being prepared and having some common sense really are the most important things. You need to be aware of your surroundings, be ready to react in the event of a problem. Wear a PFD, take a formal first aid and CPR course. It's really, everybody on board should do it. Uh, a lot of the races require two people or 30%, but really everybody should. So how to get more formal training? Well, it's actually easy to get uh, in basic EMT training in New Jersey. It's 190 hours course and they give them nights and weekends. It's not particularly expensive. A lot of community colleges do it and healthcare systems. And for anybody who's going offshore uh, for you know, more than you know, three days, it's really probably worthwhile. So I was gonna go over a couple of videos about something called a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. If you had a punctured rib, um, which could kill you. And anybody really going offshore should be familiar with this. And it'd be nice to have somebody on board who could do this. And so if you break a rib, you could puncture your lung and you might actually stop breathing. And if Again? you go Yes, we, we had a couple of questions and it might be a good time good. to just take a short break and then jump into this okay. section. Um, the first one was around the second degree burns at sea yep. and you don't have any bandages or you've used all your bandages. Uh, what, what would you do to, uh, to address the uh, second degree burns? Well, um... I think Vaseline makes a really good, uh, you know, burn covering. Um, it's it's been used oh, probably since the 1920s, uh, and uh, there's really no reason not to use it. Um, there are more advanced burn uh, creams, um, sulfidine, sulfamylon, uh, but to be honest, you know, for short-term duration, duration, Vaseline is fine. Uh, you know, what if, what if you run out of gauze? I don't know, a clean towel maybe, something clean. You know, you don't want to be introducing bacteria. I wouldn't use toilet paper, that's leaving little foreign bodies in it. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know. T-shirt, anything, anything of that? I would use saran wrap actually, or foil. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the, the next, is actually more of a question, but it's, uh, sorry, a statement, but it's around hypothermia. Yep. And just when you go to warm up the person, how, how do you address warming them up? What do you focus on warming first? Well, you know, if it's just, you know, mild hypothermia, you know, you get them someplace warm, you take off wet clothing, you put warm dry clothing on, you give them warm liquids uh, to drink. Uh, not scalding, obviously. Um, if they really have moderate to severe hypothermia, they need active rewarming. So lots of warm liquids. Uh, I would heat up water, put some warm towels, you know, right up against their skin or for ze severe hypothermia, the same thing. You know, for very severe hypothermia, what we used to see in the emergency room when I was a resident, they would bring in somebody who let's say jumped or fell into the Hudson River uh, and they'd come in in cardiac arrest with a body core temperature, let's say of 90 degrees. And we used to say, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. 
And so you'd want to be able to take their body temperature. You'd probably be doing CPR and you do it until you can warm them. And we used to actively warm people by putting catheters in the chest or in their abdomen uh, and lavaging warm fluid in uh, to try to warm them up uh, qu as quickly as we could. Um, obviously, you're not going to be able to do that on a boat. Okay. Uh, the, the next one is around antibiotics in the cefaxelin. Uh, is the question is, is it used for compound fractures? What else is it best used for? Uh, what, is it, what antibiotic? Uh, C-E-F-A-L-E-X-I-N. Cephalexin, yeah. Cephalex and ceph. It's called a first generation cephalosporin. It's certainly something reasonable on an open fracture to start somebody on. And then a question on tying bandages for an injury. Is there a standard convention for the location of the knot opposite the injury so that the surgeon knows what is underneath? I can't say I ever had a patient come in with a bandage put on by EMS that directed me where to look at a wound. I don't really, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Uh, and, and there's a question uh, just around specific antibiotics that might be might be used uh, on board a vessel. So I, I think we could probably get this one addressed outside of the chat session. So maybe, sure. uh, okay. And then there's a, um, someone asked about a suture training kit for sale. Would it be worthwhile to purchase this? Wow, there's a lot of questions. Well, I, I'm not really a fan of people without any training do, doing suturing. Most impo more important would be to clean the wound, to be honest. Um, uh, to get skills to do you know, basic suturing, you, you need to learn sterile technique. And if you don't know what sterile technique is, you can make things worse. Okay. And any, um, I don't know what they're called, but the, the basically the, the adhesive strips that keep the skin together is yeah, other things. Yeah, strips, you know, are fine, you know, to loosely oppose the edges, you know, can be useful. Sometimes you have a, you know, it's kind of a field thing, uh, even, in, you know, in the field, uh, you know, for military issues, you might take some duct tape to seal a wound to help stop some bleeding. That might be, you know, a reasonable thing. Okay. Uh, uh, there's some other questions that I think are being addressed in the chat, but uh, there's one question here about using blood clotting granule, granules or sponges. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, uh, and every, and part of that poster, if you go to that website, it shows a link to uh, what a good blood stopping kit is. And there's no doubt that some of these more advanced kind of quick clot kits works better than plain gauze. And so that is something that I keep in my, uh, in my first aid kit too, so it's uh, called quick clot. And then uh, two more questions that I'm gonna let you move on. But um, the next question is, how does a lay person obtain some of the recommended medicines and medical equipment this particular person says, I am trained as an EMT one in Connecticut. I can start IV lines, I can intubate. How would I get an intubation kit? Talk to your family doctor, that's what I would say, and explain them what you're looking to do. Okay, and then the last question before I let you move on is on liability of administrating an EpiPen. So the person is just asking, are there any liability concerns if you have to administer, not you per se, but the lay person administer? Well, you know, it's, lay people are definitely protected to some extent from liability by the Good Samaritan Clause, and that exists really in every state. Okay. You know, if you're doing CPR on somebody and you break a rib, you know, you're not gonna be sued for breaking their rib. If they're having an anaphylactic reaction, and they can talk to you, you know, I would ask permission before I jabbed them with a pen. Uh, but if you let's say somebody, you stumble upon somebody who's unconscious and you hear what the story was, I still think the Good Samaritan law would, uh, would cover you. Okay, so for those of you who are asking the questions online, please keep them up. We'll try and get to as many as possible. Uh, Gary, if you could continue, it'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so the signs of a pneumothorax or collapsed lung 
will be decreased breast sounds on the side of the injury. Uh, somebody who clearly looks like they're in respiratory distress. They may have chest pain, a rapid heart rate, and eventually it would lead to low blood pressure, shock, and death. And so hopefully this, com this link comes up. This is from the military. Can you all see this now? I'm Stefano, and I'm going to be going over the proper placement and insertion of a needle chest decompression. You can't see the, the video. Suspected tension pneumothorax, you see the video? indicating the need for a needle decompression. Oh, well, I'm, like, I'm sorry, can people see the video? No, no we don't like the video. I'm sorry? Negative. We could Negative. not see okay. the video. I, gotta, I, I think I have to restart the share with um, this. Okay, let's try it now. How about now? Sorry, I'm laughing at the picture. Yes. Yes. He has significant yes. torso trauma or primary blast injury and one or more of the following. Severe or progressive respiratory distress, severe or progressive tachypnea, absent or markedly decreased breath sounds on one side of the chest, hemoglobin oxygen saturation less than 90% on pulse oximetry, shock or traumatic cardiac arrest without obviously fatal wounds. Use a 14 or 10 gauge three and a quarter needle and catheter set and identify an insertion site. Our site is the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, just lateral to the nipple. Palpating the clavicle, we know the first rib lies just under that. We have the first intercostal space, the second rib, second intercostal space, and the third rib. I'm gonna use the third rib as a backboard, and then I'm going to ride over that third rib and advance the catheter and needle set into the pleural space. Once I pop through the pleural space, I'm gonna advance the catheter until it is flush with the patient's skin. After inserting the needle, hold it in place for five to 10 seconds to allow for decompression, and then remove the needle while leaving the catheter in place. If your first site is compromised, move to a second site. Our site is located between the fourth and fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. Taking the anterior axillary line and moving lateral to the nipple, we will locate our site. Remember to go over the rib to avoid the nerve artery and vein bundle. The needle decompression should be considered successful if respiratory distress improves or there is an obvious hissing sound as air escapes from the chest when the NDC is performed. This may be difficult to appreciate in high noise environments or hemoglobin oxygen saturation increases to 90% or greater. Note that this may take several minutes and may not happen at altitude or a casualty with no vital signs has a return of consciousness and or radial pulse. If your casualty is conscious, place them in a position of comfort. Continue to reassess your patient for the redevelopment of attention pneumo. Monitor their SpO2 and document all patient care on DD Form 1380. If the initial NDC fails to improve the casualty's signs and symptoms from the suspected tension pneumothorax, then perform a second NDC on the same side of the chest at whichever of the two recommended sites was not previously used. Use a new needle catheter unit for the second attempt. Consider, based on the mechanism of in. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to the slides. So the other skill, you know, that would be kind of uh, advanced, uh, but probably worthwhile knowing how to do is how to deal with uh, an obstructed airway. So the first thing that you would try, let's say if somebody was choking, uh, the Heimlich maneuver, uh, CPR, if that's unsuccessful. Uh, if somebody, let's say, gets hit in the boom uh, in their head and breaks their jaw and can't breathe or has neck trauma, uh, potentially somebody might need a surgical airway. Have you all seen the old MASH episodes where they take a little knife and cut down here in the neck and put a, a ballpoint pen so they can breathe through? That actually can work.
Hey everybody, it's Joe. Today I'm going to be talking you through the emergency carcothyroidotomy. TCCC has three approved techniques. And remember, no matter which technique you prefer, make sure you practice so you remain proficient. Prior to insertion, make sure that there are no defects in your cuff. The first step in this procedure is we're going to take our non-dominant hand, take your index finger, and you're going to walk down from the thyroid cartilage and find a carcothyroid membrane. If the situation permits, make sure you cleanse the site. After securing our scalpel, we're going to make a vertical incision from mid thyroid cartilage to the carcothyroid cartilage. After making your vertical incision, repalpate the cricothyroid membrane. Next, take your scalpel, place it horizontally, and puncture through the cricothyroid membrane. Take your tracheal hook, insert, and elevate against the tracheal ring. After securing the site with your trach hook, we're going to take the tip of the crack key and insert it into the incision. Once placement has been confirmed, remove the trach hook by turning it towards the patient's shoulder. Next, we're going to inflate the cuff and remove the bougie. After removing the bougie, take your EDD and confirm placement. We're going to secure the device in place. So that's really all I have for the talk. Thanks for your attention. I'll take some more questions. So, Gary, if you didn't have our attention before, I think you have it now <laughs> uh, with, with the last two videos. Um, yeah. The last one looked like it was a mannequin. Um, the, the prior one looked like it was a real person. Are, 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 were they real people or were they mannequins? Um, I think it was a combination of real people and then they went to uh, kind of a mannequin for uh, actually doing it. And so, Ann Meyer, no, you cannot practice on me, just in case you were wondering. Um, and, and this goes into the next question by Sumner. He's asking, uh, should a lay person attempt any of these procedures? Um, I, I think you need to get some skill uh, somehow of doing something like this. But, you know, if somebody was literally dying, uh, you know, with broken ribs and they couldn't breathe and they're literally, you know, you have a pulse oximeter on, you're measuring their blood pressure, it's not a reasonable thing to do. I think that would be a controversial statement, uh, but, you know, why not? And I'll take you back to your comment about the sat phone before. Yeah. And, and maybe just walking through Something how that might do that. You may be talking to an ER doctor, uh, you know, that's on shore who might try to talk you through doing something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the decompressing the pneumothorax, I could teach you how to do in 15 minutes. Um, the, the cricothyroidotomy done emergently, I've done quite a number of them in my career. Um, that's a little bit more challenging. Okay. So the questions have um, quieted down. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll just uh, take a take a short uh, promo break to talk about the club. And if you do have other questions, please come back, uh, either put them on chat or we'll open up the session so you can ask them directly. But uh, Gary, before we move to the next step, I'm, I just would like to thank you. <laughs> One person says we are recovering from the videos. Uh, <laughs> so it's definitely, definitely a, a hardcore way to end the presentation, so. Once again, thanks to Dr. Nackman for Great presentation, shocking videos. Uh, we just wanted to have a, a quick chat about RYC for some who maybe are not familiar. Uh, 
thank you everyone for joining us. A lot of participants from uh, many different channels. So we like seeing all the interest in sailing. Uh, Raritan Yacht Club is a, a yacht club tracing its roots back to 1865 in Perth Amboy. Uh, we got something for everyone. A very active sailing club. Um, a lot of social events that happen to take place throughout the year. As you can see from the list, uh, multiple opportunities to get out on the water on the bay, have a good time, uh, learn about sailing, build new relationships. A very active Wednesday night racing series, several cruising events as well, uh, and a shared boat program where you can join the club and then have access to sailboats so that if you don't own your own, you can still get out on the bay. Uh, great opportunity to meet people, uh, learn how to sail, and then maybe one day uh, find yourself on your own boat one day and maybe teaching some other people. Um, the women's sailing program is a great opportunity to learn from some very accomplished sailors that we have in the club. So everyone brings something to the party. And uh, in addition to the training sessions that we've been running on Zoom virtually, we'll be getting back to some in-person sailing classes uh, for the adult sailing program, the American Sailing Association, and the uh, youth sailing program over the summer. And when the sailing season tends to run from May to October, as it gets colder, then the hardcore sailors go out in the small boats and do some frostbiting. So we have a series of races over the winter months uh, on a one class, a one design dinghy class. And then when it gets even too cold for the frostbiters, then we bring out the radio controlled lasers and have some fierce competition uh, staying dry on the dock. Uh, so something for everybody, you can do all of it. Um, it's all available to you there if you join the club in addition to more social events coming our way over the summer. Uh, we have a very active season planned and uh, even the galley is picking up as well. So you have the galley and the bar service at the club on the dock overlooking the bay. Uh, so look forward to seeing you there. And if you're interested, I guess our next, next slide. Um, our, we have an event that we're planning uh, as part of this offshore sailing series. So we had to, we're still settling the date for it, uh, but know that it's coming up everything that you wanted to know about crewing an offshore race, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, this is where we get into the real gory details of being a crew and racing offshore, but hopefully there won't be any gory videos. Uh, and of course, if you wanna find out more about our events or more about the club, uh, you can head on over to our website, ryc.org um, and the social media channels as well. And before we hand it back to Lou, I just wanted to thank Gary uh, for his time, both for this, this session and the prior session. We very much appreciate your time and efforts here. Uh, this is fantastic, so thank you. Uh, to those of you listening, uh, we are setting up two boats and we have several people who've expressed an interest in doing the Around Long Island race, so we'll be, covering more with that with the individuals who've signed up one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, so we'll have, have those conversations, but that is one of the things that we're doing to get more people involved in the uh, offshore racing community. As far as upcoming races, the Annapolis to Newport race, we have three boats participating. Dr. Nachman's boat is one of those and we have two others from RYC. We uh, look forward to seeing all of you uh, during that race. Unfortunately, the Marion to Bermuda race has been canceled, but uh, for those who are interested next year in the Newport to Bermuda, there will be several boats from Raritan who compete in that event. Um, there are some more questions uh, that have come up. Uh, the one is, will the video presentation be put up? Uh, and, and the answer is yes, that will be online. It takes us a couple of days to edit edit that and then we will put it up. We'll let you know when it's posted. Um, lastly, there's uh, someone, uh, Ann Meyer asked, she said there, she'd be interested in a list of meds to have on board. Uh, she, she keeps most of them on, on board, but she'd be very interested if you had recommendations uh, regarding what, should, what people should have on board. So I'll let you address that. Gary? 
Well, you know, basically the ones, uh, let me go back. To, let me try to find my slide. So can everybody see this list here? Yes. So I carry intravenous antiemetics like uh, intravenous Zofran, um, epinephrine or an EpiPen, Benadryl, both liquid and pill form, prednisone, um, basically in tablet form or methylprednisolone, which is like a, a long acting uh, prednisone, phenergan uh, as a syrup, I think is very useful. Somebody can't really swallow the pills. Good old fashioned baby aspirin, uh, Imodium, Pepto-Bismol. I, I saw the question about, can you get in trouble for prescribing um, medication um, uh, that's prescribed to you? Uh, I think it depends on the class of the medication. If I had Percocet and I gave it to you um, and I'm not a physician, maybe um, who's really going to go after you for that? I think the cover would be if you did telemedicine, you say, gee, this is what, what I happen to have in my uh, supply kit doctor. Do you think I should give him that? Not a bad thing to do. Um, in terms of the antibiotics, uh, Keflex, Cipro, uh, Augmentin, um, a Z pack, um, uh, Flagyl. I think those are pretty good. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give folks two minutes if you have a question and if you want to just uh, open up your mic and ask it. I just uh, please, please go ahead. But I think we're almost done with all the questions. Not really seeing anyone uh, try and jump in. So Lou, if you want to take it away and close it out, that'd be great. Again, Gary, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, and thank you everyone for, for tuning in to um, this event. Um, the one thing that, that uh, Adam just jogged my memory, just to, to put a plug in, um, the Raritan Yacht Club, we are having a full moon, uh, actually all summer. Uh, we're having music on the deck during the full moon, uh, the full moon Friday, it's on a Friday night closest to the full moon. Um, so the bar galley and live music will be from seven, seven to 10 p.m. Um, the, 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 it will be an, on May 28th, June 25th and July, July 23rd and August 20th. Um, for, for, you know, anybody that, that um, if you're on a, a club, you know, we, we, we have guest moorings, so you can come on down and, um, you know, listen to some music, spend the night, and um, and head back. You could just contact the club for that. Um, for RYC members, I just wanted to mention that on the club calendar, it, it the, the May date is wrong. It's May 28th and not May 21st. Um, and in the future, as we uh, have more events uh, planned, I'll, I'll make sure to mention it on our upcoming events slide on the deck and, and in person. Um, as far as educational events, we, we, we will be transitioning a little bit to more live events as the, the quarantine uh, eases up. Um, we're not gonna have as much because of uh, you know, our racing activities and the cruising activities. But um, one, of the, one of the things we'll be doing is, um, is having a local, uh, Rigor, um, do an in-person presentation. That's for some time during the summer. And the topic is either gonna be on sail care or sail repair or, or, or rigging and, and, and standing rigging. Um, keep, in, keep, in, uh, you know, keep in contact for more information on that. That'll probably be sometime in August, right? Thank everyone for, for staying this long. Hello, I, I just wanted to remind, um, I don't remember the exact dates, but the Red Grant Regatta is one of the premier 
Raritan Bay uh, regattas, and the, the the race will be in July. Um, uh, does anybody know that, uh, July 16th and 18th? So uh, for any of you racers or cruisers who want to uh, do a around the buoys race, please sign up for Red Grant. It's on yacht scoring and it's July 16th through the 18th. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for taking part. We'll see you at our next uh, event. We'll get a date out on that, um, that crewing and offshore race as soon as we have it firmed, firmed up. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good night.